happy to be here. Actually, I'm a former academic myself uh, from the uh, chosen field of economics, which is not considered to be an exact science as such. But today, for instance, when you ask the economist whether the economy is going this or that way, you usually get three different answers. That's the old joke about the economist as such. Uh, basically, today uh, I will be discussing something which is related very much to the last two presentations. So about the use of open source, about the role of open innovation in the economic sense. So what, is the, what are the drivers not only for the firms, but what are the drivers for nations and national economy objectives to really look for open innovation and look for an open data solutions as such. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here in the sense that you, I will ask for kind of an interactive discussion if possible. I know it's late on Friday afternoon and everyone is waiting to go, go home or wherever you, you're going. But the idea is that some of the statements and some of the remarks that I'll be making here, I'm actually gathering feedback from you as well. Uh, for besides working for the Alta Business School, and besides working as a chief economist at the Finland Chamber of Commerce, I also work for the government. So uh, I don't know whether that's good or bad, but I, I'm one of those members in the Finnish government's digitization uh, board, which basically looks after what all those different things that different ministries and different agencies are currently doing and where would like, we would like to be in 2020, say what we need to do in the short term, what we need to do in the longer term. And I also advise the European Commission, which basically uh, explains why my slides look like this. I have the, uh, the Commission uh, template. Uh, and the case that I will be showing to you is exactly what we are doing as a public-private partnership. Uh, it's called Future Internet Public-Private Partnership, where you have research agencies, you have uh, universities, you have the large companies and the SMEs working together on a single goal. And I will be explaining what that single goal is. But furthermore, more importantly, it's all horizontally managed by the Aalto University Business School. So we are the coordinator of that project. Uh, 600 million euros, 150 participants. Uh, so it, it is very complex. As we were discussing about the complexity of data, it gets even more complex when you add into that equation also the people. So how to deal with those, those people that actually are owners and holders of the data. And uh, my uh, esteemed colleague there from the lawyer legal practice knows these IPR discussions and, and, and where, where that is actually taking. So it can be very, very complex in that sense. Uh, then, here we are. I don't have to delve in this because basically what has been said is that open source is not anymore something that happens in the back room of a building where everyone is eating pizza or drinking coke. Uh, it's acknowledged, it's approved, it is accepted, it's accepted method of doing business. And that is increasingly the case, not only here in Finland or in the kind of the advanced economies, but more and more uh, even in those countries that are kind of a less advanced than Finland or Germany or United States as well. So it, it is truly a cost efficient method of doing uh, everything for the business of IoT or for industrial internet or whatever you want to call it. And, and that is basically one of those reasons, the key reasons why the economic benefits wait for uh, using open source and using open data and open innovation platforms. The hard part comes that many companies understand what it actually stands for in very, very different ways. So for instance, in the PPP uh, program exercise that I've been doing, even if that we all agree that we have a collaboration agreement that says that the IPR belongs to the third party that uses our open source technologies, we have had to kick out some large corporates from that uh, partnership for the reason that they didn't agree with all the license agreement terms about IPRs and about the use of open source. So the kind of the legal constraints and also the understanding what constitutes open source, it's still very much a, uh, a, a discussion. There are no kind of a uniform understanding or uniform uh, models for that. So if you are an open data scientist or an open source scientist, 
you can join a community where you have a lot of big businesses and smaller businesses coming together. Uh, but you, you should be aware that uh, the agendas differ. The agendas can be very, very different in a sense. And it's not only a bad thing or more kind of adding into the complexity. It can be a refreshing thing. And I'll give you one example where we have found it to be a very, very refreshing uh, uh, in a business case. Uh, and it's smart cities. Smart cities, uh, and I call them smart cities 1.0 at the time, when people were thinking about traffic management, they were thinking about things that, how do you uh, create services for the citizens of the cities in a cost-efficient way using the open data uh, uh, reserves and all these type of things to kind of create public good, public good type of services. Yes, that's all fine and well, but in many cases those services that have been created, say for here, here instance, here in the Helsinki metropolitan region, don't scale. They don't become businesses that go and can be used in other cities and can be a kind of a global market for those type of solutions. So now in this smart city case that we are currently actually doing uh, for Horizon 2020, uh, we are looking into something we call smart city 2.0. So going beyond uh, pilot type of smart city cases and more and more towards scalable uh, business uh, solutions that are done by the big companies, by the SMEs, and by research organizations such as universities together from the very start with the same objective that it becomes sellable, scalable business. You go after the global market in the, in the smart cities as such. And there we are learning new things on all sides. Uh, what it means to create, create that type of a uh, single motivation that still uh, gives room for the public good ideas and that gives room for the commercialization of those technologies. I've been there, I've been done that. When I was at Nokia for 12 years, my responsibility was to work with the World Bank, was to work with the public organizations and to create PPP models between them and the industries so that the development aid and the development programs that were being done uh, or created in Africa, in Latin America and in Asia were actually uh, there to create uh, also market opportunities and business opportunities and wealth for those countries. So instead of just doing the public good, really showing that doing trade, doing business is actually that, that gives you the opportunity to go up on the economic ladder, on the economic development as such. So I'm not transferring that knowledge and background to Europe. So what it is that we're doing now with the open source and the open innovation ecosystem in Europe is exactly the same. We are trying to create new competitiveness for the European companies and the European countries. And by God, we all know that we need it. Because we are at the stage here in Finland, for instance, where we have to do very concrete, very pragmatic things instead of, yet again, another strategy paper that goes there in the bookshelf and no one reads it. We have to do things that are providing short-term value, either for the companies or for the universities or for uh, the national government, to that matter, as such. I'm trying to be a bit provocative here, so happy, happy to have any, any uh, discussions on that. So, this is the ambition, what I just said. We are here for the long term. We are creating something that has economic value. We are creating something that is understandable for all those partners in the public-private partnership. It has added value for all of them. So we're not trying to uh, create something where only one company or a group of large companies takes most of the value and the rest are, are left behind. That's, that's not the idea. And what the Commission currently uses for all open source based initiatives and activities, or they would like at last that to be the kind of the single term, is an open source service platform. So that combines the PPP model of doing things with the open source based uh, softwares that are used for building the different solutions and applications as such. I will be at the Hannover Messe, for instance, in two weeks' time to discuss with the German companies how the open service platform 
uh, work that we are doing with the various European companies fits right in into the industry 4.0 uh, activities that they are currently doing. And the Germans are very enthusiastic at this point. So it's very happy to see the, the Bosch example because now it's not only Bosch and the other big companies, but more and more the Mittelstand companies of Germany that are into the open service ideas and the open source ideas as such. This is where we started from. So for any of you who would like to go to the website, you can go to a website called fiveware.org, uh, where basically all the different activities since 2012 are listed. We have news, we have uh, maps, actually very nice virtual maps where you can go into and click what are the companies, what type of organizations are being created. There are success stories of those companies that are using the open source based technologies and what are the fields where they're actually uh, now currently conducting their businesses. And as usual with any easy exercises, the, the numbers are huge. You're talking about, like I said, 600 million and so forth, and a lot of money put into this, but it's only 300 million from the commission and three, another 300 million from the companies. So that makes it a kind of a very different, uh, it's not only using the taxpayers' money, but it's actually using the money, <coughs> money from the company's coffers as well. This is what we did. Uh, we are currently here in the last phase, because by the end of this year, the future internet PPP comes to its end. But it's not the end of the technology platforms or the solutions or whatever you want to call them that we have created. <coughs> there will be a Fiverr Foundation that was already launched at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona this year. And the 1st of June in Vienna, there is the founding... Uh, <coughs> sorry, I, is there some water or something? Yeah. Uh, there will be a founding uh, meeting where other companies, so not only the companies that are currently part of the PPP exercise, will be adjoining. And the idea is that we will have all different type of verticals. So we're not only talking about verticals where fiber is going to be used in the smart cities. It's a good case example with the politicians, but it's not, not the whole idea of the exercise. The exercise, in a sense, the objective is that we will actually tap into the companies such as Atos and Siemens and Telefonica and the others that are part of this exercise to go after the markets of smart energy uh, to go into the fields of smart logistics, and even more importantly, smart agriculture. Agriculture is still by far, in some of the key member states in Europe, it's a very, very big business. Take Poland and France, for example. So we're really going after the national economic structures of the member states, and we are using fiber in a way that it makes the best sense for a specific country. That explains why smart agriculture for Poland, for instance. For Finland, it is industrial internet. And industrial internet is something that you read on the papers all the time. And the ETLA came out with the paper earlier on that said that Finland can be the Silicon Valley of the industrial internet. Fine, that's a good, good goal. And, and actually the idea is that, for instance, here in Otaniemi campus, there will be an industrial internet campus where companies not only come to do technology development, but basically it's a dissemination point also for open source technologies and the technologies towards those SMEs who don't have technology background. So companies that are still doing a lot of things with the pen and paper, and I'm not joking. Even here in Finland, when you go outside of the metropolitan region and you go outside of the urban centers and you go to a small company, they are still using fax machines. So that's basically the reality where we currently are. I toured 10 different chambers in Finland and I met with the CEOs of those SMEs and I know what is the sorry state of the digitalization of Finland in the current terms. So even if that we are highly advanced in some fields, in some fields we have still a lot of work to be done 
And those are the areas where open source and open innovation actually enable us to do that in a faster fashion with no vendor lock-in to single provider. And then also to do it in a way that you are actually spreading out the competence and, and the IPRs around those companies here in Finland. That's the reason I get several calls from Cisco and other big boys all the time asking me that how do we get in? Because they would like to be part of this ever larging or widening network of open innovation where you actually still have the possibility to make business. So we're not publicly funded after the end of this year. It will be a commercial entity of that kind. <coughs> so that's what I was kind of a saying in a sense that it will become, and it has already become, a sustainable open innovation ecosystem. There are 5,000 European SMEs currently using Fiware. There are not that many other exercises or initiatives where we have been able to get companies coming into an EU program of our kind. Because previously, whenever you asked a company, and especially an SME, to join an EU initiative or a project, the first question is that I don't have the resources, I don't have the time, I don't have, I can't do all those reporting to Brussels all the time. We took that away. We actually created a investment mechanism where the SMEs who are joining in, and that explains where there are, why there are 5,000 of them, don't have to do any reporting to Brussels. And when we launched that, that was the key when we were getting a lot of companies into this open innovation ecosystem that we have created. Because we took away a lot of the things that they, they, were, scary, they were scared, uh, exactly the bureaucracy, the fact that you you're not allowed to have your own IPR by using the technologies and so forth. So we created a new pool for a European uh, program, of, which is unique in a sense. <clears throat> and beyond 2015, we are not only doing this as a European exercise. In many times when you think about digitalization strategies of uh, selected countries, take for instance here in Finland. I've been part of those discussions for a better part of 15 years. And usually what happens is that you get a group of experts and group of people in the same room like this, and everyone starts to think that how do you digitalize the Finnish economy and the Finnish firms and what are the next steps that you want to do. And lo and behold, it happens very much in the national context. You don't think in global terms. You don't think in European terms. You think in the Finnish terms. And in many cases, you think about that you have to build everything on your own. That you cannot actually tap into something that has been already invented outside of your own perimeter as such. That's something that I'm, I'm finding not only a kind of a Finnish approach, but it's a very much the approach in many of the other EU countries as well. And my main task within the whole PPP exercise here has been going around to convince not only businesses, but also the political leaders and decision makers that you can do it things here in Europe by taking some of the best practices from Finland, some from Germany, some from France, there are good things in France besides cheese and bread and that type of things as well, and some from the UK, for example. And when you put that together, you actually create something which is a European platform or European solution, but geared for the global market. And that here is something that we have been very open about since we're talking about openness. We are not trying to build something which is uh, a challenge to Google or a challenge to Microsoft or a challenge to Cisco. We're actually building something that we can do in cooperation. If they want to agree with the principles of our ecosystem, they can join. But at the same time, we are there for the global market as well. We're not doing an isolated European exercise as such. Actually, last year we made a deal with the U.S. federal government that their smart city programs will start using our Fiware smart city platform. So we sold the uh, European platform for smart cities for the American uh, 
policy maker program on how to make their cities smarter as well. And I would like to say that that's, that was a bit of an achievement and it took a lot of work, but it, it was something that we were able to pull through because we understood not only the business perspectives of that, but also what the public sector and in the US, especially the federal government wanted in that sense. And what they wanted was open source and they wanted to have a larger open innovation ecosystem as, as we had created in Europe, for instance. So we are covering all the bases with the narratives, obviously as an economist and as, as a policymaker myself, uh, that's the key. Uh, technology comes second, really. Technology is something that if you, if you create something and you start developing something and at the end when that something is done, then you only think about that, how do I sell this? Or how do I take this forward? Or what do I actually do with this? That's the kind of the dilemma that we would want, wanted to avoid from the very beginning. We had bold ambition. We created a very appealing story, a very attractive story for various stakeholders. And then we went out. And we started gathering feedback both negative and positive feedback, and we improved from that, and this is where we ended up with. We ended up with a product, yes, a technology product, but we even better created a comp, I would say, kind of a new base for European competitiveness in areas where uh, we have, were traditionally started to be left behind by the Americans and by the Asian companies. So this is what we, we ended up with. I don't have to go into the last slide as says. But here, here we are. So this is what I said, more or less. So an open service platform with the ecosystem things, a lot of buzzwords, a lot of nice things that people like to, like to hear. But then you have to explain what it means in practice and what are the things that we have, <coughs> we have been doing. And, and I would like to guide you really to go into the fiverr.org website to look into all those different case examples that we have in there. And they're all open source. They're all based on the fact that people came in, they started doing uh, challenges and hackathons in a traditional way, and then based on that, they started to create new solutions, new companies, actually new jobs in that sense as well. So the industry commitment that we had from the very beginning for going after the targeted verticals that I mentioned, the smart verticals, uh, ranging from agriculture to logistics as such, is something that you, we, we, we took from the very beginning as a, as a target, what we needed to do. But at the same time, linking into whether it's the Finnish digitalization strategy or the industry 4.0 strategy, it became not only a European exercise, but it became embedded in the strategies of Finland, Germany, Sweden, uh, France, and Spain, and all of those other countries. That's what we did. That's basically uh, the beauty, I would say, of open innovation, that no one knew at the beginning of the exercise what, in the end, we would, like to, we would have as a, as a kind of an end product. I didn't know it when I joined in 2013. But I think that's part of the, the journey that you do with open data and with open source and, and all those things. You let people coming in, you ask for their ideas, you comply with those ideas, you change your plans, you become more and more flexible. And the European Commission is by far not known for its flexibility. But in this case, they, they outdid themselves. They really created those new investing mechanisms and they created a uh, form for the future PPPs that will be coming out. Everyone now knows that there is one for big data. There is one for 5G, which is more traditional technology development. There will be one for cybersecurity. All of those will be based on a PPP model that will take the lessons learned, both the negatives and the positives from our our flagship project there as well. Very good. I'll, I think I'll end in there, but I'm happy to take any questions or do we go directly to the panel? Okay, well, thank you very <coughs> much, Ilka.